Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Wouter Kuipers from the Eindhoven University of Technology, or ever, more specifically from uh, Tech United, the robot soccer team. And I always like to start my presentations off by telling you about my dream. It's the dream of 2050. And this dream is a specific one, and I think everybody should have thought about this before I start the presentation. So what I usually do at the start of my presentation is ask everybody to close their eyes. Don't do that because I imagine it's Sunday, 9 o'clock. Don't close your eyes, just keep them open. But imagine you're in a soccer stadium, and imagine you're in a soccer stadium in 2050, and you're going to watch one of the greatest games in human history. Because for the first time, you're going to watch a game of autonomous robots playing versus the human world champion. So you're there in the stadium, you've got your seat, and then when the ceremony starts, the players are walking on the field. And now imagine, what do those players look like? Do they have legs? Do they have wheels? Do they have two legs? Maybe three legs? Do they hoover across the field? Do they have eyes? Do they have a hat? Think about this. Because we have already been thinking about this for a long time. RoboCup is a federation of researchers all across the globe which work in, on realizing this dream, this dream of 2050. All the people in RoboCup have thought about this and are working towards that moment in 2050 when the human world champion is beaten by a pair or a team of you, uh, autonomous robots. A pair would even be nicer in these, but um, of course this is towards 2050, this is an amazing challenge. Yeah? It's big, you need le maybe lags, you need artificial intelligence, vision algorithms, you need all kinds of game statistics. Well, luckily, we are not all tasked with this enormous challenge. We've, or at least the RoboCup, has divided it in a few parts. So, three of the leagues which are in RoboCup, just to give you a picture, um, and these leaks all aim towards a different part of this challenge. So it wouldn't be smart with all those thousands of researchers to just start researching towards it or this autonomous team, but we've divided it. So here on the left, you see the small size leak. Small size leak, those are uh, yeah, hockey puck robots, maybe a bit larger. They play almost 11 versus 11 robots. And they really focus on strategy. On the total right, we see the NOW robots. Probably you've all seen them. Well, if you know them and you like them, you should definitely come to RoboCup one day, because these robots play five versus five, and it looks really great. These robots playing soccer, well, you know they are good at walking, but they walk a little bit stiff, so they're walking like this, and then there is a ball, and then they lift their leg, and then the moment of tension is there, because are they going to kick the ball, or will they fall over before they do that? <laughs> a lot of anthropomorphism, by the way, because the, <laughs> there are lots of people screaming at these robots. But in the middle, there is the middle size leak, and that's the leak. We have robots on wheels and a normal standard FIFA size ball. The main thing here, and I will also point that during the presentation a couple of times, these robots are autonomous systems. There is nobody controlling them with a keyboard or a joystick. Once we put these robots on the field, they have to do everything by themselves. We cannot do anything. Means, you all know, maybe sometimes you check in a bug in the repository or something. If that happens with these soccer robots in the first minute, we're screwed. We cannot do anything and, for example, all passes will go wrong. You can imagine what kind of tension and dynamics that brings to a team. The main thing is, middle size league is decentralized. That means every player can play soccer on its own. It has all the sensors and actuators on board. And yeah, this is actually, it's nice that we have this camera. So this is one of the soccer robots we have. So this robot can actually do everything himself. And that's the beauty. On the other hand, we had the small size leak. And that leak has a central sensing system. So that means these robots just get uh, um, commands like, go there, go there from some central computer. So that means that if the central computer falls away, 
those robots can't play, and we can play. These robots are connection with Wi-Fi, so it's a multi-agent system, but I will get back to that in a moment. I was just talking about these great team dynamics, right? So I got one picture which explains how the team feels during a match. That's like the whole spectrum. On the left, we see the people that, well, are not too positive about what's happening. Then in the middle, we have neutral surprise effect. And then on the right, there are people which are already a bit more positive. This is great. This is the team, Tech United Eindhoven, who are, bu we, who we are building these uh, soccer robots. A lot of different emotions. But at the end of a game, luckily last year, there was only one real emotion that was there. Because last year in 2018, we became the world champion in our league. Thank you very much. <laughs> a while ago, I did a presentation. I had to wait, I wait two minutes for uh, applause. So <laughs> it's good that you're all awake. <laughs> That means uh, we became world champion in 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018. We also see some kind of pattern there, but this year we're going to break that pattern. <laughs> However, adding, adding that we became second in 2008, 2009, 2010, and all the other years in between, that means that we already played 11 final matches in the world championship in a row, and that's, uh, that's great. But let's stop talking let's do a bit of ro watch a little bit of uh, robot soccer i guess that's the future anyway so this was uh, two weeks ago at the portuguese open 2019 and uh, we're playing here versus the team of uh, portugal so it's a kind of a european championship the blue uh, team is in this case uh, tech united and we're here in the attack, just take a, taking a throw in. Trying to get around the Portuguese defense, which is really good. It's really difficult, but with passing, trying, shielding. We managed to score at least some goals. <laughs> it's always a keeper in the way. It's a shame. Yeah, they have to be robust eh, to, to those things. Trying to keep in the ball, rotating around. <coughs> of course, this might happen. Eh? The Portuguese team had some kind of uh, failure in their coat, causing their robots to stall. Yeah, we didn't take the opportunity. That's even worse, I think. <laughs> <coughs> so we could have scored a goal there. Well, just to give you a bit of an idea, this is, I already told you we're going to watch Robot Soccer and hopefully we're going to do that much more. Let me give you an idea. World Championship 2013 in Eindhoven, here in the Netherlands, in the south, Brabant indeed. Uh, and let's see what happened in the final match there. Five seconds before the game would end in normal time. We are, as Tech United, one goal behind. We score. These are thousands of people watching robot soccer. This is not some clever video edit. These are really thousands of people watching a soccer game with robots. They have already been looking at it for half an hour. It was Extremely exciting, of course, also because the home team was there. So the <laughs> Unfortunately, as you remember, 2012, 2014, it's not there. Eh? 2013, we became second because in overtime, the Chinese team from Beijing, they managed to get our victory. And this is one of the most, uh, well, yeah, it's not good. 2013, <laughs> losing in your hometown, that's not good. But let me introduce you after some uh, Robot Soccer games to the real stars. These are the Tech United RoboCup team limited editions, Turtles. I always wonder what came first, the abbreviation or the name, but <coughs> these are the Turtles. Here we see one keeper, we have one of those on the field, and four field players. And uh, I brought one here as well. And let's see some things in action. 
um, because I want to tell you a little bit about what these robots can do. I already mentioned that all sensors, actuators, and computing has to be on this platform. So let me show you how this uh, works. Uh, so I also got a video here, but I can also show it. So maybe the camera can come a little bit closer. I can also come a little bit close to the camera. Because these robots should be able to dribble with the ball. So we'll now uh, show you the ball handling system of the robots. I have one colleague over, by the way, over there. She's uh, controlling the robot, but just standing, keep the ball in your claws. And I will now show you that we can actually take the ball with us and actually go anywhere we want while keeping the ball in our ball handling system. At currently, I'm moving, of course, the robot because if there would go some, if something would go wrong, and it would just drive in that direction, we shouldn't think about that. But it's just rolling the ball with the robot, and that's really important because it's one of the rules we've added, and that's really nice to say because in RoboCup we're aiming towards 2050. We're using already the laws of the FIFA the FIFA rules of the match, but we've added some extra rules just to make sure that these robots progress in the right way. Because if you would play the game of soccer without adding any additional rules, we've already seen that you will get kind of like a tank robot which just picks up the ball and then moves the ball to the other side of the field like a tank, throwing away all the other opponents and then shooting extremely hard. But that's not what we want. So, for example, we added the rule that if we use our robots to dribble the ball, the ball should roll almost naturally. So if I'm rolling the ball, then you also see that the ball always rolls naturally. I don't roll the ball like this, that I'm stepping the ball around. And that's really important, because the ball always has to roll in our match. If that's not the case, you can even get a yellow card. Or a robot can get a yellow card. Then comes the interesting part of this morning, because we can also shoot. It's, of course, necessary to uh, when we're close to the goal. And we'll first show you a flat shot, just to make sure everybody's awake. So let's see. I need to aim it manually a little bit, so I hope for the cameraman that we uh, don't hit him. So this is not even full power yet, but we have to be a bit careful here. Flat shot. And be careful, people there on the first row. Eh? So they will see a flat shot, and that's all done by the robot autonomously. Ah, this is of course one of those. It's the uh, new to our. Uh, well, does it work? No. Have you a kick effort, uh, Hoogstep? It's of course robotics. Eh? Usually they do everything autonomous, but then at this moment somebody is. Uh... Did you look, answer? Wait, no. There is only one way to do this. Eh? Let's turn it off and on again. <laughs> also in robotics, that really works. So I will quickly uh, progress uh, to the next slide just to tell you something about. Uh, the, the sensors of these robots will definitely get back to the shooting, by the way, but let's see, yeah. So this is one of the additional sensors we have on the platform. So aside from actuating, we have, of course, also need to sense. So we have a Kinect sensor on the front. It's one of those uh, sensors which is usually with a uh, Xbox. And in this case, we don't use it to stand in front of it and make uh, weird uh, motions, but we use it to track the ball. As you can see in the video, we try to draw a red uh, box around the ball. That's what we do with the Kinect. But this robot also needs to know autonomously where it is on the field. And it should know that by using onboard sensors. So for example, using GPS, that's considered as not onboard, using external signals. So we also have to do that, have to find some solution to do this on the robot. So that's actually why we use this Omnivision camera. It's here on the top of the robot. It's a camera facing upwards into a parabolic mirror. And with that, it creates one of these warped images where you can actually see a lot. You can see the field lines, which we use to determine where we are on the field. We see black obstacles, 
those are the opponents. We see yellow ball, and that's all the input almost that we need for determining what we should do. And then one of the things we could do is, of course, kick. Let's see if it uh, works. Are you ready, answer? Let's see. Second try. Yeah? It's, of course, the demonstration effect. Can you do a, a kick effort down lob shot? You'll always see that this goes wrong during the demonstration. We'll have a look after the presentation quickly uh, to see what's happening. Um, let's see. Um, but I was telling, oh, I was telling about these, uh, this vision system. Eh? So um, we see black as other robots. We see uh, yellow objects as a ball. We have green. Uh, we have a green field and white lines, and that's um, approximately all the colors there are. And it's very well defined. So the environment in which we work is really well defined. And that's great, because we can just do color segmentation. Everything which is yellow is a ball. Everything which is black is a robot. Works like that. Works like a charm. So before, like two years ago, we really didn't need any cool uh, artificial neural networks using vision, uh, that kind of stuff. We could just use color segmentation. Everything which is yellow as a ball works like a charm. Um, but now we find that robots can also play with uh, t-shirts. I don't have the one from uh, Robin uh, from Perslucht around, but um, we have t-shirts. So they can be orange, uh, they can be all kinds of colors. And that means that this black part is more difficult to determine. So we need to look at how does a robot look? And, well, Anthony Horowitz once said, you cannot defeat your enemies until you know who you are, who, until you know who they are. That also really applies to this. So how do we know what object is a robot? And we have quite some ways to find this, because, for example, it's quite pylon-shaped, and you will see all our opponents are also pylon-shaped. So, our mission was to detect robot players and identify to which team they belong. So finding robots should be quite simple, but then also finding to which team they belong, they, you have to do that with like the t-shirt, guessing the, well, the nation from the t-shirt. This is research done by one of my colleagues, and what we're aiming to do is take pictures of robots. In this case, we done a test with our own robots. We took a lot of pictures from all different sites, but this takes time. We took around 200 pictures. You know you need quite a lot of input uh, data. So we took a lot of pictures. But yeah, we imagined that at a world championship, we were trying to do this. And then, yeah, we had to also take pictures of opponent robots. And you cannot ask the opponent, if we can just take four pictures, that would be OK. But if you have to take a lot of pictures, that doesn't really work. So we were trying to find a way to do this with less images, say only four left, right, uh, front, back, and then we would uh, augment the data. We would use a lot of like these four images and turn four into 32,000 images just by making sure that we warp them in the correct way uh, because we are going to use this algorithm for the Omnivision camera. So we need to make sure that we warp them according to the shape of this Omnivision sensor. And then, of course, we would also, well, apply color variations, and we would rotate, shift, put a different background uh, there, and all that to make sure that we can recognize these robots on the field. As I already mentioned, that's quite difficult, because robots come in very uh, different colors and different sizes. So this is uh, one of our normal robots. You sometimes get something like this. This actually doesn't work, but this is one of our opponents. Of course, mechanical engineers use a lot of duct tape, so that's why yeah, we try to keep everything together with that. Uh, then you also have robots which look a little bit different. Uh, this is a team using a different top camera as we uh, are using. This is uh, the Portuguese team with their magenta t-shirt. This is a Portuguese team with their cyan t-shirt. So this takes a whole lot of time and a whole lot of pictures. So we're currently looking into gathering all these images and still trying to find this pylon-shaped uh, 
uh, size, and it actually is already working quite well. So this is, let's say we have an input image which looks something like this. So this is, again, one of those images from the Omnivision camera. These are uh, three Tech United robots, so the orange ones playing versus one other robot uh, during a game. And this is actually an in-game uh, picture we took. And what we can then do is run an uh, inference uh, convolutional neural network on it, try to find the orange t-shirts. Well, that works quite OK. We have all three. There is some outlier somewhere over here. No clue why. But we use the class activated bitmap so we can see which features are activated. And based on those features, uh, we can see if it's either the orange team or the blue team in this case. So in this case, you see also the blue recognition is, of course, here. That's really good. Uh, one thing we did notice with this data is we also have the opportunity to put on some uh, LEDs like on the bottom of the robot. Uh, need for speed uh, looks great uh, kind of stuff. But that also bugs uh, ourselves because you see that the class activated bitmap also shows a feature at the position of one of our own robots. So that means we have to put it off these uh, very cool uh, lights. Uh, but from these activations, we can actually see uh, using a blob detector, which position a certain class has, whether it's blue team, orange team, uh, magenta team, cyan team, whatever. So this is currently ongoing. And I think that what sums the current status is a little bit is that this is working all fine, but this is offline. We have pictures, we tr augment them offline, we inference the CNN on a different computer than on this robot. So it's not working in real time, and that makes this really difficult. So currently our future work for this would be try to get it working on, for example, an NVIDIA Jetson uh, board or something similar, um, or TPU, which we can just uh, plug into our computer, and try to get this working in the loop. Not only just on a computer on the side, because that's actually not allowed, eh? they should be autonomous, but trying to get this work in real time, that's really difficult. And we're trying to see how we can include uh, knowledge we already have, models, uh, to make this faster. <clears throat> so this is one of the things we're working on. So vision, convolutional neural networks, trying to detect robots, and trying to t detect to which team they belong. Let's see. There's another great <laughs> saying, know your opponent and you'll never lose, know yourself and you'll always win, uh, Sun Tzu. But the thing is, we thought we start with the first and then we'll see how we end up with the second thing. That's always difficult, eh? know yourself. So what we're trying to do is opponent action prediction. The thing is, we have a lot of data. We, these robots collect data during a match, they collect all the things they see, all the things they know about themselves. They all collect that, store that, and after the match, we can unload it from the robot and then have all that data. We already have it from 92 World Championship matches, and we thought, let's do something with that. Of course, we do something with it. We use it to track down bugs and see what went wrong at each stage of the game. But we now also want to use this game uh, data to predict the action of the opponent. So in the research done by one of my colleagues, we're looking uh, into, is this possible? Is this feasible? So what we did, uh, if we, because we want to also get the ground truth, what was the opponent really going to do? And yeah, we could classify, of course, what the opponent is going to do. But the best thing is, we can also try that on our own team. So without knowing what we are going to do, so which action the robot decides to do, we can just use all the data we have, like positions, velocity. We also have that from the opponents. We try to train a network to predict what our own robot is going to do. And then we'll use the ground truth data to well, well, give the, the result of this, uh, this test. So to give you a little bit of test, how does this neural network look? So we're going to have a stop here. And now the question to you would be, what is this robot going to do? Any ideas, clues? Run with, it. Run with it is one of the opportunities indeed. Any other? Shoot on goal. You can also give a pass. But the main question is, so with this limited amount of knowledge you have, 
So with this two seconds of video, is that enough for you or for any neural network to predict what this, uh, this or own robot is going to do? And the best thing, I know what this robot is going to do because I, uh, he collected data during the match, so we know he's actually going to do something. And we can check whether the artificial neural network actually predicts the right thing. But how to do this? Because this game state, this game state, this two seconds of video, contains a lot of information, right? It contains spatial information, temporal information. How do you uh, hand that over to an artificial neural network? And that's actually where uh, temporal occupancy grid maps came into place. So I will have to explain this probably. This is a field, a soccer field, or a small part of it actually. And this is one of our robots. And our robot is currently at position 2112, where the 255 is. And it drove there on the route which is shown by the blah, blue, blah, blue uh, path. So this is the temporal information, this blue path, which is increasing in intensity, and the spatial information that's given by which grid map cells are activated. So how does this look? We can do this for our own team, all robots. So we have here on the top, for example, you see one which has no uh, diminishing tail. So that's our goalkeeper. And you see some of our robots are advancing downwards, right? The intensity above is low, and it gets higher when it's down. So somewhere here is the opponent goal. And we also do that for the opponents. So we also have their information, where they have been and where they are currently. And we also devise such a tail. And then we can do the same for a ball. And then we hypothesize that all the information you just saw in the video is also in this temporal occupancy grid map. So again, from this picture, you should be able to say, tell me what, if I would query the next action of this robot, what that robot is going to do. <coughs> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see what uh, is going on. What we did <laughs> is use two uh, convolutional neural networks. There's a lot of information, I will quickly go over it, but this is one of the more simpler uh, proposed uh, artificial neural networks for such an application. The right one uh, is something we added, we made some additions uh, to that to make sure the input data gets a bit more uh, uh, in the, the network, but not to bother you too much with that. Um, what we did is a test. So can we actually do this? Is our hypothesis, will it work? Will this way of temporal occupancy grid maps work? And what we did is we took four years of data on world championships, so that's four years back, and we did an evaluation test. So we just looked at what does the network predict and what do our robots actually do? And this actually showed that if we use 10 frames, so that's approximately half a second of data, we could actually predict our own action with an accuracy of 77%, which is quite good. Because if we can use this information, the 77%, it would be quite nice if we would have that really during a game. Uh, well, the training accuracy, yeah, so testing it on the training set, not the validation set, showed that we could even potentially use even more trained game situations, so training even more yeah, would still lead to a higher training accuracy. So that shows promising results. But again, this is also done offline. So we're currently also looking into, if by the way you see that in this case the red line is a convolutional neural network too, so that's uh, this network on the right, you'll probably if you already look to some of the, the steps there, this is really hard to do this real time and imagine while also playing soccer. That's, that's the thing. So this is, uh, doing this real, uh, real time is really difficult, but we're uh, working on it. The main question I always want to tell everybody, uh, and that is, uh, why do you actually build robots? I didn't get the question uh, today yet, but uh, usually I get this question a lot. Why do you actually build robots? Because it's, of course, fun, but can't we just do something better like saving the world or trying to solve the world uh, hunger problem or anything like that? 
why do we build soccer? Well, soccer is a great way to enthuse people to progress research to robotics and artificial intelligence. You haven't been, maybe some of you actually have been to RoboCup, but if you go there, there are thousands of researchers which work, if they can, if the security of the venue doesn't kick them out, they work continuously almost. They want to win the world championship in their league. Thousands of top researchers in robotics and artificial intelligence. They're very driven because they want to become world champion. Also with our team, we go with 10 people. We make days from 8 in the morning to 11 uh, at night, and the next day we go on again, all to win this title. But in the meantime, we are progressing artificial intelligence and robotics. And that's great because these technologies can be used in autonomous driving, consumer robotics, these kinds of things we develop. Uh, but we also, within Tech United, we want to make this more concrete. So we actually, some years ago, built Amigo, which is the robot here, uh, uh, second from the right. Uh, that's Amigo, and that's our caretaking robot. Uh, one of the main things we think robotics in the future will improve is that, for example, the lives of our elderly here. So making sure that elderly can stay at home longer, that they can, for example, get their medication, uh, that maybe somebody can well, bring them to bed, maybe even, or guide them to the toilet, that would be great. But as you might know, in Holland, we don't, we don't have enough caretaking personnel, so usually we send them to some elderly home. And yeah, that's not the way we want this. And we think robotics can actually do something here. So that, that's first, we built Amigo, uh, then we built Sergio, fully on the right. It's a robot which actually can uh, bend through his knees. He doesn't have arms yet, we're currently <laughs> working on that. <laughs> it's of course important if you want to give somebody, uh, someone medication, you need that. And here on the second from the left, uh, you see one of our robots which uh, we are currently participating with. This is a robot by Toyota. And it's called the Hero Human, uh, it's a human support robot. And this robot uh, is currently also competing in the world championship of caretaking robots. <laughs> How does that look? I uh, hear, uh, you <laughs> hear you ask. So this is uh, the final match in the German Open. Uh, this is still with Amigo. And here we see Amigo. And certainly there's no soccer field anymore. There's just a robot and a table and there are some people walking around. And this robot now has to pick up a, a soda can, pick it up and then bring it back to the person who asked for it or put it on the table. The nice thing is, these robots, they don't speak yet. It's, a, it's an ongoing project, but you, you can't communicate with these. Also, if you're on a soccer field, don't stand in between the robot and its goal. With Amigo, you can. Amigo can handle uh, people asking stuff. Amigo can handle uh, people that stand in the way and just go nicely around it. And that's great, because Amigo is really the first step towards this keeping elderly at home uh, longer. One of the things, of course, all elderly use some kind of uh, messaging service. So this is uh, a final match, an open challenge, where we used uh, Telegram to control the robot. So on the side, on the right, you'll see uh, the Telegram messages. So check who's at the door, and then Amigo will go and check. Uh, there's apparently someone at the door. We have to take him to the living room. Then Sergio also comes in. So two robots walking around. We have to find uh, someone called Josha. Ah, well, apparently uh, she's in the bedroom. We have to take her to Lars. Then they are together. We give them something to drink. It's awesome. <laughs> Doing stuff with grippers is difficult. But that's, this is really the next step. And the nice thing is, Tech United is this not only a soccer playing team, but also a team with caretaking robots. And the main thing is that there is a great um, interface between those two teams. These teams are really working together very well. S uh, methods we use in robot soccer are also being applied in at home, uh, in this at home league, we call it, and vice versa. So we can ex uh, uh, interchange all kinds of theories and methods uh, to make sure that we really advance robotics and artificial uh, intelligence. Well, to in the end, 
also consumer robotics and also autonomous driving. But it would be really cool if in 2040, for example, there would be uh, well, a robot priced, uh, well, fe feasibly priced for elderly, that they can actually take one of those robots, put them in their homes, and it will just say, hey, you need to take medication. Hey, I will guide you to the toilet if you want. Just tell me what you want. Usually, at the end of this presentation, I have one slide, which is if the whole presentation went OK, then I show this slide that autonomous robotics also can go wrong. I think you already know that it can go wrong, and we'll try another time, but uh, just to let you, because it's also a funny video, for this one, maybe if there's some extra sound, it uh, would be nice. Uh, so this is uh, practicing a penalty some years ago. Robot is ready to take the penalty. Keeper in the goal. Whoa! 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 Oh! 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 Yeah, yeah. So this is autonomous soccer robot. Uh, well, maybe a bit put into scene. Maybe this was the time when we couldn't uh, make the video cuts uh, exactly right. So uh, this is, of course, this is put in scene. This was at some uh, marriage of our uh, one of our team members. We wanted to show the people that attended the wedding what kind of great software he built. <laughs> so that's actually what we did here. I think they already got a, a good impression about what uh, what is it. The thing is, autonomous robotic soccer is really cool, and I hope to have uh, told you everything about that, or at least scratching the surface maybe a little bit. What I think is that robotic soccer, and hopefully it will go to mainstream. Currently, we see those things with the League of Legends, for example, and Twitch. Well, why wouldn't these matches be live-streamed all across the globe? It would be wonderful, and that would really be the next step towards 2050, when these robots, or maybe those robots you came up with, the three legs, the two legs, maybe hoovering robots. Those robots maybe will look like the, the dream of one of you. But in 2050, beat the world champion. Doesn't matter how they look like, as long as we can do that. What we know for sure is that by 2050 then, we have progressed artificial intelligence and robotics so far that we probably already have uh, autonomous driving and we also have uh, great new uh, consumer robotics, but also these robots at home, for example, which we can help our elderly uh, stay home longer. So that was uh, my presentation. Uh, possibly there are some questions, I guess. So I'm welcome to answer them. <laughs> <coughs>